Turning now to Yemen, where for more than three years now, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels have been, been engaged in a brutal war against a Saudi that has the support and the backing of the United States. Reporting from inside the areas controlled by the rebels is rare and very dangerous. Jane Ferguson, a PBS special correspondent, she managed to smuggle herself into rebel-held Yemen to see what life was like there. Here's a piece of her reporting and a quick word of warning may be difficult to watch. Life is slipping away from Maimona Shagadar. She suffers the agony of starvation in silence. No longer able to walk or talk, at 11 years old, little Maimona's emaciated body weighs just 24 pounds. Watching over her is older brother Najib, who brought her to this remote hospital in Yemen, desperate to get help. The nurses here fight for the lives of children who are starving. Because of the war, she is suffering from malnutrition. Her father is jobless. Most of the families in Yemen are jobless. Every day, she says she sees these sorts of cases. People have lost work, therefore they've no money, therefore there's just no food in the house. You were never supposed to see these images of Maimona. A blockade of rebel-held northern Yemen stops reporters from getting here. Journalists are not allowed on flights into the area. No cameras, no pictures. The only way into rebel-held Yemen is to smuggle yourself in. And for me, that means to be dressed entirely as a Yemeni woman with a full face veil just to get through the checkpoints. I traveled across the embattled front lines to see what's actually happening inside what the United Nations is calling the world's worst humanitarian disaster. And here on set with me is Jane Ferguson, a special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Jane, remarkable reporting, heartbreaking reporting. The most remarkable thing is that you got inside there at all because journalists really can't get in. How did you do it? It's extremely difficult for journalists to cross that front line, essentially, and get into rebel-held area. And, you know, as we saw in that report, I had to go in smuggled, essentially, disguised as a Yemeni, because Yemenis are able to move back and forth between the areas that are controlled by the internationally recognized government and those that are held by the rebels. So, but for journalists, there are so many checkpoints. There's maybe 70 checkpoints between the south and the capital in the north. Over half of those are uh, by the forces that are controlled by the coalition. So they are stopping journalists from entering. Because they don't want people out there to see the images coming from that part of Yemen, I imagine. They certainly don't. They have given journalists access to those southern areas. They give visas to go to Aden City in the south and to travel around those areas. They don't want journalists going to the north, speaking to the rebels, interviewing them, but also talking about this international crisis and about the fact that it is man-made. It is a, as a direct result of this war. And it's already the, world, the Middle East poorest country and now they're dealing with a war there. Now, were you afraid at all? I was afraid plenty of times. I mean, there, there are different risks in Yemen, and there have been for years, even before this war came along. It is an area where al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is very active. Uh, there's a kidnapping threat. And then, of course, there are the airstrikes. But once you get into the northern held areas, the, the, the risks change somewhat. There's always a risk that you know, rebels could decide to arrest you. They have detained foreigners before and continue to, but... Uh, but, you know, I mean, Yemen's always been a risky country, so there is an element of fear there. The other thing I was wondering is, is we had pictures of malnourished children, starving children. How do you, and a lot of journalists have to think about this, how do you behave professionally? How do you remain a journalist when you're standing in front of a child who is starving to death, essentially? It's challenging in, in the sense that to process it sometimes is a delayed function. You know, perhaps you process it in chunks. At the time, you're a professional, you're working, you're so focused on getting your job done. Your adrenaline is rushing. Absolutely. And you're thinking of a million other mundane things like microphones and your team members and translations. And I'm trying to think in Arabic. And that's very challenging. And then when you're alone in a hotel room at night is whenever I think you really process. And after an, an assignment like this, you take time off to really sort of let that settle. You're now in New York on a break from those assignments. Do you feel like your personality has changed covering some of these regions, covering some of these wars? 
I suppose so. I mean, I think everyone changes all the time with the experiences that they go through in life, no matter what those experiences are. And there are a lot of reporters covering some horrifying things in the Middle East and have been doing for years now, especially whenever you consider uh, the war against ISIS in Iraq Which and in covered. Syria. That's right, yeah. I mean, these levels of violence, you know, I think it, it does take a lot of self-care. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, journalists are increasingly more aware of our own emotional needs and the needs to take good care of ourselves and good care of each other. You know, I live uh, in Beirut and there are a lot of foreign correspondents there and we're a very close-knit community and uh, of American and European journalists and, uh, and we, we sort of look out for one another on, on a level of emotional support as well as friendship. Yeah, that is so essential. And speaking of Iraq, you spoke with Yazidi women who were really tortured by ISIS, targeted by ISIS, uh, and we're watching some of that video now. How did you gain their trust? How did you gain their trust to tell you some of the most awful things they've experienced? They are an incredibly resilient people. I mean, they've had to be, given what they've, they've gone through. But in Iraq generally, but especially with this community, there's a deep sense of hospitality. They are so welcoming to strangers that come in, but it has to be said, it is, I think, there are advantages to covering that story as a woman. It is, there, you know, easier for me to be able to, and I wouldn't, I, I hesitate to use the word easy, but it's certainly less tough. You're not as threatening because you're a woman. Yeah, and I can see that they are more comfortable with me in the room. Now, my, my cameraman for that assignment was male. It was a, and, uh, and that was, you know, he, he knew when he had to sort of sure. sit back and sometimes not even enter a building um, until I'd been in to talk to the, to the ladies. The fixer in that case was uh, female, the producers on the ground. Those, so, so having a more female-focused team did help. I want to ask you quickly, one of your reports from Yemen, you literally showed a bomb of, of uh, not a bomb, a mountain of bombs made in the U.S. sitting there in Yemen. They were unexploded bombs. How angry are people in Yemen right now at the United States? They're very angry, especially in the rebel-held areas. And what's important to stress is that, you know, whenever you talk to people off cameras, quietly, you know, people in the street may not speak as openly as they, as they would like to about politics, but whenever you talk to people quietly in their, in their houses, um, Yemenis are very hospita uh, hospitable as well, so they invite you to their houses a lot. So you get to speak to them. Those that don't support the rebels, as well as those that do, say that they really don't understand why the U.S. is so deeply involved. And in the 20 or so seconds we have left, I want to show the birthday present you got from your partner, which is a very useful birthday <laughs> present. Tell us what that was. A flak jacket. A uh, flak jacket. Yeah, this followed on from a sat phone a few years back for... Uh, for Christmas because, uh, you know, he just would like to know that I'm Much more useful safe. than cake. Jane Ferguson, <laughs> congratulations on all your reporting. Thank really you. tremendous to meet you, and good luck with everything. Thank, Thank you. you.